Hello! We're going to go through Chapter 4 that will be on the midterm, um, specifically occupational crime issues. Chapter 4 also includes a vocational crime, but we're not going to be focusing that on that until after the midterm. So let's review our definitions. Occupational crime is a legal crime or greed-driven activities committed within the context of a legitimate operation or occupation. So for example, if I'm your accountant and I'm embezzling money from you, that's an occupational crime. A vocational crime are crimes committed by white collar employees that are not related to their job. For example, tax evasion or purchasing stolen goods. <clears throat> So we're going to start off talking about small businesses with occupational crime. Um, examples of crimes committed by small businesses include deceptive advertising, illegal pricing practices, sale of stolen goods, and this happens all the time. These uh, guys who hijack trucks and take a whole pile of stuff, they show up at the back doors of these little businesses because they don't track their inventory in the same way that Target or Walmart does. And of course, you know, if you normally spend $50 on a product that some guy shows up at the back door and says he'll give it to you for 20, that increases your profit by another $30. So a lot of small business owners do do these things. Non-payment of taxes, bribing state officials, and exploiting employees. And we've talked a little bit about how the exploitation of employees happens, especially in the restaurant business, vis-a-vis -vis the article on Chickie and Pete's. Retail crime. Some of the more common crimes seen in retail establishments include short weighing. And this is when the scale is reset to start at a higher number than zero. So if you get a pound of turkey, it might actually be three quarters of a pound, but you're paying for a pound. And it doesn't seem like that would be a lot of money, but if they do it every single time they sell a pound of turkey, they are adding up all those quarter pounds or $2 or $1.25 that they're making per each pound. And if they sell 100 pounds in a week, that's $125. So again, you know, these are small crimes that can grow depending on how many customers they have. Another common one is called bait and switch. This is when you go to a store that is advertising a sale on a particular item you want. They are out of the product, but they convince you to buy a higher priced similar product. So for example, let's say that you need a new pair of boots and you see an advertisement that you can get a new pair of boots, leather, for $99. So you take yourself out to the store and you get there and you find out that the only sizes they have are size 5 and size 15. Well, clearly you don't fit those sizes. Most people don't. But for $149, they have a lovely pair of boots in your size. And you think, eh, well, I'm already here. I might as well just go ahead and buy them and spend the extra money rather than have to go shopping elsewhere. That's what they're counting on. The fact that you won't go somewhere else. You will be baited. You will switch and buy something else that's more expensive. Another crime that you see in retail is paying tax on non-taxable items. Food, clothing, footwear, among the items most frequently exempted in Pennsylvania, meaning they don't have to pay tax on those things. But the laws are kind of crazy and a little confusing. So for example, soda is taxed, but certain vitamin waters and high sugar drinks are not. Um, in one store, potato chips might get taxed. In another store, potato chips are not taxed. So you see all these issues because people are not aware of what is taxed and what isn't taxed. And there are times that even tax agents don't understand. Um, you do not, for example, have to pay sales tax when you buy an American flag in Pennsylvania. So if you go into a dollar store and they charge you tax, you can get your seven or eight cents back. Restaurant crimes. These are the ones that most of us have experienced without even realizing it. You know, you go to dinner, you have, you fill on pizza or hoagies or something, 
and you go home and you just don't feel very good. And it's not like you just don't feel good regular, it's you don't feel good, period. And oftentimes what happens is that the food you're being sold is expired. And that, in fact, can impact whether or not the food has bacteria in it. Another common one is removing mold and serving the food item. They do this with bread all the time. You cut off the moldy part, you toast the bread, nobody knows the difference. Um, demanding tips from the servers, just like Chickie and Pete's were doing. Labeling food as kosher or halal when it is not. Kosher food is for Orthodox Jewish people who um, don't eat pork and they have to have the animal slaughtered in a particular way and has to be blessed by a rabbi. Halal is for Muslim people and it's very similar. The food has to be blessed, the animal has to be slaughtered in a particular way. Having kosher or halal is very religion specific and a lot of places will do kosher style or halal style but it's not ultimately kosher or halal because the kitchen has not been blessed itself. Um, so, you know, and if, if you're not an Orthodox Jewish person or an Orthodox Muslim, it's probably not a big deal to you. But if you are Orthodox, this is a huge issue for people. Um, other issues, unhygienic food handling. And here's our, my friend, Chris Farley, dressed as the lunch lady with his finger in his mouth, which of course is very disgusting. And then last but not least, bribing health, health officials to avoid closures or fines. Now up here you're going to see three pictures. This is mouse droppings found at a Domino's pizza. This is out of date food found at a chicken cottage, which is a restaurant in England. And then unclean premises, which is found at a Papa John's. So you know these restaurants and you can be assured the next time you eat and don't feel well, it's probably because something was um, not right in the kitchen. The next <clears throat> occupational crimes we're going to be looking at are crimes committed against certain vulnerable groups. And what that means is a vulnerable group is someone who is not capable of really making intelligent decisions or competent decisions. Now, we start with the poor. The poor absolutely have every ability to learn this stuff, but unfortunately, they oftentimes don't have the resources to learn this stuff. They don't go to college, they don't have access to college educated people who can give them advice, and oftentimes they're being told what to do by people who are equally poor and equally as useless as they are, but who proclaim they know better. So some of the elements that you see, um, payday lending. These, this is when you get paid every other Friday and then you have no money by the first week. So you go to the store, the payday lender and you get an, a cash advance basically that you then have to pay 20 to 35% interest on, which is ridiculous. Um, another one that um, has been seen and has been dealt with in the courts multiple times is rent-a-center type places where you don't have $500 to go buy a new TV. So you go to rent a center and every month you pay $50 for some crappy television and you've rented it for three years. So $50 times 12 months in a year is $600. Then times three years is $1,800. You're paying $1,800 to rent a crappy television. The issue is that poor people don't know how to improve their credit rating to even get a credit card to help them afford some of these um, items that they could pay off over six or seven months instead of getting ripped off by a rent to own place. Another thing that has been seen are prices getting jacked up on the day welfare checks are distributed. So suddenly that 99 cent bottle of um, soda is now a dollar fifty or that carton of eggs that was a dollar twenty nine is now a dollar fifty nine the problem is is that the small stores the little bodegas on the corners they're not controlled and they can raise and lower their prices at will and of course when they know that 
demand is high on a particular day, they can increase their prices and people will pay them. The next vulnerable group is the old. And these are the old folks who live in nursing homes um, and people who live at home who require, who require home health care aids. And unfortunately, a lot of these companies overcharge and underserve their clients. You know, it's, it's a horrific idea that some of these places, they don't feed the residents correctly. They're not changing their diapers. They're letting them get bed sores really gross, horrifying things, but these people are old and they don't really have a lot of people coming to visit them. So these kinds of crimes are ignored because there's no one there to point them out. The last bullet on this page are funeral homes and funeral homes are in a tricky business. They have to deal with people who are, deal who are very upset, grieving, but they're also in the business to make a profit because that's what capitalism is all about. So they're, what they've done is they give you, they have the basic version of the burial, but then they also have upsells. It's kind of like going to McDonald's and ordering a sandwich and fries and they always ask, do you want a soda with that? Or do you want an apple pie? Or do you want cookies? The funeral home has the basic package. And their goal is to sell you as many extras as they can because that's going to help them improve their profit. So, for example, you can have somebody's ashes um, collected and crystallized into diamonds that you can then wear. That's a very expensive option. Alternatively, you can get an urn for your loved one's ashes with their face lasered onto the front of it. A little odd, but again, people will do crazy things when they're grieving. So it's all about what is the extras that they can charge that will eventually give them a higher profit. The biggest small business fraud seems to come from auto repairs and they have the highest rate of complaints against them, including unnecessary repairs, faulty repairs, overcharging for parts. When you read chapter four, you're gonna see multiple examples of studies that were done where they were essentially out to prove that these auto repair places are pretty crooked, and they did. You know, um, they would send out a car that is perfect condition with one wire loose, and you know, mechanics would return with everything from a $5 repair to $5,000 repair. So it really kind of makes the consumer have to question and get second, third opinion about a vehicle because there are so many issues in this. And everybody you know has an issue with a car repair place. I guarantee it. Okay, so we're gonna go from small businesses to prestigious professionals. Now, what is a prestigious professional? Well, these include doctors, lawyers, professors, scientists, and the clergy, priests, rabbis, ministers. These types of jobs usually require an advanced or graduate degree. So they have an MA, an MS, a JD, which is a Juris Doctorate if they're a lawyer, an MD if they're a doctor, um, PhDs, all kinds of advanced degrees out there. So what you're seeing is these folks tend to have three elements that, again, make it possible for them to engage in high levels of white collar crime. First, they're very independent. Then they have a high degree of authority. And last but not least, and this is the most important part, is it's a high level of trust between the individual and the people they work with. If you go to a priest to confess, you have to trust him to keep your secrets. If you go to a lawyer, and you need to write out a will, you're trusting him. If you go to your doctor's office and you want to know what that thing growing on your other thing is, you're going to trust them. So let's talk about medical crimes first. Doctors exercise what we call professional dominance over patients, meaning that they have a level of knowledge that is completely outside of what most people understand. They also have had in their experience a high level of trust placed in them. And this begins 
for the consumer as children when we go to the pediatrician and our mom or dad holds our hand while we get our shots and then we get our lollipop and you know mom and dad tell us we're brave and what a good little boy or girl we are and again what we're doing is at this very young age learning that we are supposed to trust our doctors now the sad part is historically the american medical association has been less concerned with policing its members and more concerned with protecting its own interests which is completely natural people want to take care of their own business they don't want bad publicity to be out there in terms of violence and medical crime according to the national academy of science as many as ninety eight thousand americans die each year of preventable medical errors that's a huge number um, it is estimated that 15 to 20 percent of surgeries performed each year are unnecessary so if the doctor says that you know you need to have your gallbladder removed it's probably you need your gallbladder removed but if the doctor says hey you know you have um, a deviated septum and I think that's what's causing problems for you you might want to get that fixed well that's when you get a second opinion um, and and again you know a lot of this comes down to our capitalistic or capital capitalism um, construct which is it's a profit motive you know doctors have to make a profit and a lot of doctors are willing to do whatever it takes to make that profit and in the United States we call that a fee for service the fastest growing medical service in this country belongs to plastic surgeons they pay cat you pay cash to a plastic surgeon mostly because most plastic surgeons focus in on things like nose jobs eye lifts chin lifts and all of those are optional and because they're optional you have to pay cash and these folks will pay cash to make them look younger sexier whatever and again people die during plastic surgery Kanye's Kanye West's mother died um, on the plastic surgeon's table still doesn't stop people from getting the plastic surgery next we're gonna look at Medicare and Medicaid fraud Medicare is the federal health insurance program for people who are 65 or older and certain younger people with disabilities Medicaid provides low cost or free health coverage to more than 50 million children families pregnant women and people with disabilities in the United States so these this kind of wraps up all of the um, health insurance for young children which this is one of the reasons that the affordable health care has been put in to try and help these folks um, people who can't afford their health insurance have been getting grants and accepted into Medicaid so that they don't have to pay but they still have health insurance the cost of Medicaid and Medicare fraud is about a hundred billion that's billion with a B a year and this is defrauded from the federal government by health care providers who fraudulently bill for services and medications not provided up to and including pharmacists doctors hospitals clinics all of them have some element of fraud in them not saying that all hospitals are fraudulent but every category has somebody in it who is committing some level of fraud the biggest problem with investigating these crimes is that they are very expensive and it costs a lot to identify investigate and prosecute these folks so for example it's usually about 200 million dollars to track down 1 billion dollars in fraud and that sounds like a pretty decent financial equation however here's the issue is that if the money is not there in the beginning the FBI cannot spend it so they don't see it as an opportunity lost where they could make more money they see it as being too expensive to pursue and I know that doesn't make a lot of sense but the article I handed out in class will give you more insight into that ultimately what it all means is that the government is reluctant to spend even more money to stop these medical practitioners move it on 
legal crime. This is when a lawyer engages in criminal conduct in the course of their duties, including fraud and overbilling. Often the desire to win a case is stronger than ensuring all actions that are taken are legal. Lawyers also engage in fraud when they're given the power of attorney. So power of attorney is when you designate an attorney, usually, to act for you in all legal and financial matters. And what you end up seeing in this kind of a scenario is that if you have a crooked lawyer, they're going to take money out of your account and make legal choices based on their best interests, not yours. Another element is called con collusion. Collusion is the line between client attorney confidentiality and being party to a legal activity. And it's often crossed, which is why a lot of times lawyers don't even want to know if their clients are guilty. Because then the question is, how much illegal activity are they going to have to be exposed to? Another element is that there are many cases where lawyers and their clients work together to commit fraud against insurance companies. Lawyers and clients, you know, if you get a, a, a crooked lawyer and a crooked client, they will work together to commit fraud against a third party. Corporate legal fraud. So now we go from the little guys to the big guys. These attorneys are supposed to be looking out for the bench best interests of the shareholders of the corporation. And they often do the bidding of the cor corrupt corporate executives who hired them. So the reality in all of this is that even though they're supposed to be looking out for the best interests of their shareholders, they are going to get fired if they don't do what their corporate executives who hired them tell them to do. More importantly, these are not the lawyers who get disbarred. Disbarred means thrown out of the legal profession, no longer able to practice law. Disbarred lawyers tend to be marginalized solo practitioners who don't work for corporations. Those are the little guys. And the little guys are easy to pick on and get rid of. Then we're moving into academic crime. Now, here's one of the all-time great crimes by an academic. In the late 1980s, a professor at New York University was convicted of using NYU labs to manufacture and sell illegal drugs. But it wasn't based on the show Breaking Bad or anything. Um, uh, overall, though, most professors do not engage in that much crime because we don't have the opportunity, to be honest. We're not given that much control over budgets. We're not given that much control over um, students without having all of the accreditation issues in line. The crime that you see most professors committing is plagiarism. Um, we have here a picture of Stephen Ambrose, who is a very respected historian, and he was found to have plagiarized some of his work. Another very prominent historian, Doris Kearns Godwin, um, wrote the book Team of Rivals about Abraham Lincoln, and it was revealed that she had done some plagiarism early in her career. Again, you know, a lot of times plagiarism is not meant as a intentional crime it can be unintentional but nonetheless the professor is the one who's responsible for ensuring that everything they promote and um, publish is original work other academic crimes include the misuse or embezzlement of grant money and university funds they forge their credentials which is getting much much harder today in the age of the computer world they engage in gross negligence, and they, use crea they create data used in fraudulent scholarly articles. Um, a lot of professors have to publish in order to keep their jobs. And if the data is not working out to what their hypothesis is, they will create data to support their hypothesis, which is clearly wrong. Um, some professors have been known to expose students to unsafe conditions. And then there's also the element of conflicts of interest with research studies. So, for example, if um, I'm a researcher doing research on drugs and the ability to concentrate, and suddenly the uh, National Marijuana Association for 
teaching pays me a hundred thousand dollars to do a research study on how pot helps you concentrate and then I come out and I say absolutely it does even though every other study says uh, it's the same as being drunk yeah no that's a conflict of interest because I accepted money from them this is one of the more common crimes that you see also in the biochem fields because they have so much interaction with pharmaceutical um, companies Let's end this with religious crime. Um, people tend to inherently trust their religious leaders. I remember from a very young age having to go to confession to my priest. And, you know, when I'm seven, I didn't have a lot to confess and I had to make some stuff up. But as I got older, I began to edit what I told the priest because I didn't really trust him. And a lot of people, as they get older, realize that the trust that they place in religious leaders is not always warranted. The most common religious crime is embezzlement. This is an example in the 1980s. This is Jim Baker and Tammy Faye Baker. Um, they ran the PTL Ministries. Um, they were taking huge amounts of religious donations to live an extravagant lifestyle. It was so bad that Jim Baker went to prison for fraud, and that was unheard of. This was a big deal back in the 80s. It was on the news every single night. Last but not least, one of the most um, telling religious, cri or religious crimes over the past few decades has had really not anything to do with white collar crime except for the fact that it was hidden and covered up. The Catholic Church has been under attack for covering up molestation allegations against many priests. And again, this isn't necessarily a white collar crime, but the purpose behind the cover up was to avoid having to pay large cash settlements to the victims and eventually when all of this stuff came out it was discovered that yes in fact they had to pay large cash settlements to the victims so in the long run it didn't help them this is where the information stops in terms of the midterm we'll pick up the next section in chapter four after spring break